Welcome back to the Romance Class YouTube channel and our series featuring the audio edition of my book Iris After the Incident, narrated by Rachel Coates. Head over to romanceclassbooks.com for more romance by Filipino authors. Content warnings are mentioned in Chapter 1 and are included in the description for this video. Chapter 10 How do you take this off? Here, let me. His place, his bedroom, his hands, looking for the zipper that would release me from my dress, his mattress, a little softer than what I was used to, but this wasn't about my spine health. This was me, in my black bra and panties, lying on another guy's bed for the first time since you know what. Counting breaths. Don't worry about that, he'd said, when I made a move to take his shirt off for him. When I went for his belt buckle instead. When I'd attempted to undress myself instead, I was made to lie back and wait, and my hands grabbed at his bed sheets in anticipation. He undressed like he was in no hurry, so annoying, first releasing his belt, hanging it up on a hook behind his bedroom door, then pulling his shirt off, throwing it toward a corner of the room and right into a laundry basket, pants off, and then draped over a chair next to the bed. I bit into my thumb to suppress a giggle and didn't quite succeed. What? Gio asked, blessedly making it to the foot of his own bed, only in boxers. You're neat. Usually. I could look at him all night, all parts of him. He seemed to be totally okay with being shirtless, and there was so much for me to see. But those eyes drew me in again. Didn't think I'd be into eyes, of all things, so instead I let my hands explore everything else. He crawled over me, and I touched his shoulders first, then pressed my palms against his chest. I loved this part. I mean, I enjoyed what you were about to do in general, but this part, that first time, when you're both discovering each other, was exhilarating, and it wouldn't happen again. That moment when you're introducing yourself to someone in this way, and you do so reverently, when you're sober, and you're not in a rush, it's the best. He was kissing my throat, taking his time there his tongue making lazy sweeps down my collarbone toward my chest. I took that time to check out his waist, the feel of his hips, solid, or I knew mine would be softer. With a snap, the straps that secured my bra went limp, and my breath caught when his mouth captured a nipple, and his hands cradled my breasts. Still good. This wasn't ruined yet for me. You're gorgeous, he was saying between licks unbelievably gorgeous. I could believe him. Or if I didn't, maybe I already did by the time he had moved on to my other breast, which he may have liked even more because it got way more attention, but I needed his mouth on mine. I needed to kiss him. So I yanked him up and higher by the hair and claimed the lips that had been wandering for too long, like this. I was able to press up against him, felt the friction, the heat of his skin behind those last layers of fabric that separated us. He loved my hair, loved seeing it on his sheets, loved the tips brushing against his arms when he had flipped us over and had me on top. This was how he entered me, protected by latex, hips pushing up, my hair on his skin tickled, he said later, like a breeze, different from the heady pleasure of enduring my tongue, my teeth, my nails. Because I was on him, and I gave as good as I got. It was lust, it was energy, it was relief. He was hard and slick and full. I loved his slow thrusts like I love lazy Sundays because they felt luxurious and warm like they could last forever. I craved his quick thrusts because they were perfect. They were extraordinarily efficient. Like, I knew I'd get there and in how many strokes if he kept it up. He loved my tongue, too. Loved that thing I did when he had pushed himself up so we were upright on the bed, connected still, and I was Frenching him to match how he pulsed inside me. This was much later, and here, when I realized that this was how I wanted to let go. Kissing him, wrapped around him, and I warned him I would. Like this? He gasped. God, 
yes, now. And I did moaning into his mouth, grinding into him, into his quick thrusts. I was hanging on to him like this, still lazily kissing him, when I felt him pull out and come. It was sweat and lips, and it was still all good. Thank goodness. So, I told him, as I tapped my disposable fork over the lid of my cup noodles, I usually come here and buy food when I'm hungry at 2 a.m., and there are other people here when I do that. It's never really empty. Gio was mixing powdered creamer into his brewed coffee. Night shift, makes sense. And the convenience stores are still open at this hour. I didn't really think about how many of them were going out for a snack after sex. This guy, this adorable blue-eyed guy I just had sex with and now was having snacks with, started laughing. His coffee sloshed in his cup and a drop spilled at the tabletop. Why stop at 2 a.m.? People are probably having sex at noon when they take off for lunch. I smiled. <laughs> Afternoon coffee breaks. Quickies before dinner. You can get a room by the hour so it's convenient for everyone. After a sip from that more stable cup, he added, I used to think about that. How everyone was getting to have all this fun sex whenever they wanted. Everyone but me. But I thought you were getting some action with your ex, weren't you? He paused, probably deliberating how much to share. Not that I needed him to. I already had what I considered too much information about his ex-girlfriend. And while that was a curiosity and novelty last week, today, I felt like scrubbing my brain, if I could. It did not help that I could imagine, for example, that no sex probably did not exclude oral and that they were probably doing everything short of the actual to get each other off. It's different, he said, choosing to be vague. Yeah, we were fooling around, but it was hard to enjoy it. She was never really alone with me, and if we were, when we were done, it's like everyone knew what we were up to. We were sitting on stools, on the same side of a white plastic table, facing the windows of the 24-7 store. Maybe we still looked exactly how we did when we lined up to get movie tickets, same outfits, down to the shoes. The hair, though, the way his was sort of randomly sticking up in bunches in the back, the way mine was heavy with the residue of dried sweat. I reached out to smooth his hair down, but it bounced right back up once my fingers let go. The people who know what you were doing are the ones who already have that in the brain, I said. You could have been playing chess in a locked room, and they would have been thinking it. That's nice, if you were actually playing chess. This was making me remember my own short history with sex. It had only ever been with Bradley, though he wasn't my first boyfriend. He was the guy right before we graduated from college, and we only were as adventurous as we had been because it looked like it was going to be only him, always. Not true. How old are you now, Gio? Twenty-three. Why, how old are you? Twenty-four. Despite it being stubborn, I tried smoothing his hair down again. Do you feel old? Gio asked me. Because of what happened? I don't know. Maybe? Because I wasn't having a lot of fun for a long time? I moved here because I knew someone who was letting go of the apartment of 9J, Gio said. He was a few batches ahead of me in college. Now that I took his place, I've been hanging out with his friends, and they're a little older than me, and I like it. How much older? Four or five years. They're cool, but it might be because they're not related to anyone I know, or they're just handling life better. I was sitting in toxic shit for so long, I didn't even know it. You mean the girlfriend in show business? The girlfriend in show business, the manager, her sister who's cool but actually kind of liked me, their brother who will probably beat me up senseless when he next sees me, their parents who are country club brunch buddies with my parents, by the way, and also business partners, so this screw-up of mine made everything complicated. And then there's that network executive who really, really wanted her to be the virgin role model, and that other dude in her show who kept hitting on her, and that gossip blog that kept posting photos of us together... Wow, I said. That birthday threesome was a disaster waiting to happen. I didn't want it to be me. I mean, it's messed up, but 
I didn't want to be the cause of it. It was late, and we were tired, so he could have just been tired. Or that was actual anguish there, weighing on his shoulders, hovering, bearing down on him. At least you're free. Are you happier? Yes. He faced me and rested his face into the curve of my neck. It was unexpected, and it tickled, but I faced the glass and watched us there instead. Wow. That fast, huh? Not fast at all. You're okay? Yes. Yes, I am. I think this is a good second date, then. I nudged him a little, and our combined silhouette moved together, then back again. I agree. That was chapter 10 of Iris After the Incident, narrated by Rachel Coates. Text and production copyright by Mina Viesguerra. If a really early breakfast date is your idea of romantic, also check out Songs to Your Beat by J.E. Tria. Link in the description.